Thank you first, uh, Janik Madam, for the very kind words and for inviting me to give the AST uh, Memorial Lecture. Along with my father, he is one of the persons who inspired me to take dermatology, so it's a special honor for me to be giving this talk. Um, when I was thinking about what I should talk about, I thought I should bring all the three passions that I have, which is um, I'm a keen gardener, so I want to talk about plants. I'm also very keen on history and I love dermatology. So I thought I'll combine all three by uh, this topic, which is a brief history of botanic dermatology. So I'm going to divide my talk into five parts. I know a lot has been talked about Professor AST, but I just want to mention a couple of things about him. And then we'll go on to the ancient history of botanic dermatology, how plants have been used to treat skin conditions for more than 4,000 years. We'll then briefly look at the relationship between botany and dermatology. And then finally, we'll conclude by looking at the benefits and the detrimental effects of uh, plants on skin conditions. So, Professor AST, I mean, how can you uh, possibly uh, summarize what he's done in two slides? But I'm going to just talk about a couple of aspects which I feel are relevant. His dedication to dermatology is legendary. We, we all know that he used to go to MMC before the crack of dawn and he used to stay there till well after sunset. He's dedicated his whole life. He was single and he dedicated his whole life there. He also started, initiated classes which began at six o'clock in the morning. And this was every day, I, I believe, including Sunday. And as Ramesh has already said, if any student came slightly late, he will say, oh, you're late for tomorrow morning's class. So that's the way he was. He was also extremely um, unique in his um, dedication to dermatology. He always used to say, dermatology is a jealous mistress. So when I went to give him my wedding invitation, I, I don't think he was that happy about it. His lectures, of course, were incredibly inspiring. Um, I remember attending a, a couple of his lectures when he was in KJ Hospital because he had retired by the time I joined MMC. And they used to be so theatrical. I mean, not only was the content great, the way he did it was fantastic as well. He used to take five rupee notes and autograph it and give it to the students who, who answered the questions correctly. So all those are still so vivid in my memory. Um, he also used to mention PP in his lectures. Now, don't think that PP is uh, private practice. It's puttagam puratal, which means you read your books and how relevant it is even today. I mean, if you don't keep up to date, you're going to be left behind. And that's, that's the same, whether you're in um, national service or in private practice, you have to keep up with uh, the, the subject of dermatology. He was also very benevolent. Um, he was liberal in what he gave. I mean, he was a devout Christian and he used to give so much to the local church. Uh, and that, again, is something we should always aspire towards. Now, staying on the topic of Professor AST, this gentleman, Dr. Paul Sapapathy, contacted me about three months ago. He's based in the U UK. He's uh, lived here for more than 50 years. And he is a family friend of AST and used to visit their family quite often. Uh, and I think there are some, um, he is related to him in some way as well. Now he brought to my attention that Professor AST's uh, grave does not have anything, uh, doesn't have a tombstone which mentions his name at all. This is the grave where he's buried. It's actually his mother's grave, but I believe he's buried there as well. And you can see there's no mention of Professor AST at all. The only uh, reference to him is the scratched note on the concrete, which is the 11-5-2011, which is the day he died. So, unfortunately, there is no uh, way by which we can know that this is Professor AST's grave. So he's actually contacted Professor AST's um, family and he's got permission from them. And he has a relative in Chennai who's able to do the work and he's proposing that this is the tombstone which he wants to, to put up. He, I believe the total uh, amount which will be required is 2 lakhs of which he's already given 1 lakh. 
So if anybody wants to contribute or anybody wants to know more about this, please do contact Dr. Paul Sapapati or you can contact me and I'm quite happy to pass on the information to him. Uh, he basically is in his late eight, uh, 70s and he wants to do this in the next few months because we, he wants to preserve the legacy of Professor AST. So let's go on to the topic itself. You may wonder what plants or botany can teach dermatologists or perhaps even doctors in general. Now my nephew pointed out to this verse in the Bible which in Job 12.8 it says, Ask the plants of the earth and they will teach you. Uh, over the next 20 to 30 minutes I would try to prove that this is right. So let's start off with the ancient history of botanic dermatology. Um, now Egyptian and Indian medicine actually predates European science by many many centuries. So most of the information from ancient history comes from these sources. Egyptian history was, uh, Egyptian medicine was documented in documents called papyri. Now papyri are, uh, are tall aquatic plants which grow along the Nile River and their stems are used to document notes and there are a variety of papyrus available. Uh, the one which have most information on skin or medicine in general are the Smith's papyrus and the Ebers papyrus. Uh, and the Ebers papyrus is currently the largest record of uh, medicine, particularly dermatology and it's in the Leipzig University Library. And considering that it was written 2000 or 4000 years ago, it's 2000 BC, the variety of conditions that are mentioned and the variety of treatments that are used is truly astounding. So let's look at the Ebers papyrus. Firstly, they mention that onions are used for purulent wounds and also for boils and also it's used as an anti-inflammatory agent. In fact, it is still used as a household remedies in many parts of the world. Just 50 years ago, it was found that they contain two ingredients, allen and allicin, and these are supposed to have anti-inflammatory properties. The Ebers papyrus also has a whole chapter on castor oil plant, and we know that castor oil is still used as a hair growth stimulant at present. Um, incense is the extract from the olibarum tree, and this contains something called boswellic acid. And boswellic acid is used to treat a variety of inflammatory conditions. And again, they found that it has anti-inflammatory properties and in vitro, it also has anti-melanoma cell properties. So it's anti-neoplastic as well. So it's amazing that the Egyptians actually used things which are shown to have scientific rational now. So that is truly something phenomenal. In 2000 BC, Egyptian, Egyptian physicians used to ask their patients with vitiligo to take up leaves of a plant called Amimagus. This used to grow along the river Nile. So they used to ask them to take these leaves and then put the juice on the vitiligenous skin and then expose it to the sun. Similarly, in 1400 BC, Indian physicians used to boil a plant called Soralia corlifola. Now that's where we get the term sorolin from. And after they boiled it, they took that extract, put it on the skin and then exposed their skin to the sun. And this was basically the precursors for modern day Puva. So it looks like the Egyptian and Indian physicians were way ahead of their game. So they knew about this 4,000 years ago. Now we also know that skin uh, plant products can be used for cosmetics so henna is a medicinal plant it's de derived from a medicinal shrub called lausonia and it's found in egyptian mummies so if you look at egyptian mummies many of their nails and hairs have been painted and that's from derived from the henna it was brought to india in about the 12th century and it was brought from persia by the mughals and since then, it's been embraced into the culture of Indian ceremonies. For example, many uh, young women wear mehndi or 
henna uh, just before the functions and it has a lot of medicinal use as well it's used as a preoperative skin marker some people use it to camouflage vitiligo uh, also to camouflage some of the dystrophic uh, nails and there's an excellent review article in the IJDVL which came just this uh, in December last month uh, what you're seeing is the henna leaves and it's dried it's powdered and then you get the henna powder and then the henna powder is used as you can see for a variety of purposes here it's used to dye the hair and then it's also used to uh, put as a temporary tattoo before weddings next let's look at uh, how botany and uh, dermatology are related so we look at the specialty itself and then we look at a few prominent um, people uh, dermatologists who profess their love for um, botany so let's um, the main thing is the way botany and dermatology are, are related is because in both specialties there are a variety of plants and skin conditions which look incredibly similar so because they look so similar you need some form of orderly thinking and that's when Carl Linnaeus came in in 1753 he produced probably a revolution in the sciences in fact more people have probably benefited from Carl Linnaeus uh, more dermatologists have been benefited from him than any other medical specialty now he proposed that we classify plants according to taxonomy and nomenclature and he had something which had a generic name and followed by a specific term for example um, if you look at foxglove which is the plant from which you get uh, the wonder dog digitalis is called digitalis purpurea now similarly dermatologists took that on too so for example we call some conditions acne vulgaris and other conditions are called acne fulminans and this all depends on the morphology of the skin lesion that we see the other other similarity between botany and dermatology are they are both very visual sciences so both of them look at pattern recognition so as long as you have pattern recognition then you're going to be a good dermatologist and that's a big similarity for both conditions and finally we've already seen that for more than 4000 years plant der derivatives have been used to treat a variety of skin conditions now let's look at a few british dermatologists who've been inspired by botany where else to start but with the father of dermatology which is robert willen now robert willen is the first person to use illustrations to look at dermatological conditions and in fact he was also the first person to make a classification of skin conditions according to how they looked um, some of his ideas may not have been his own it may have actually come from joseph plank who is a hungarian dermatologist who lived in vienna and almost certainly looking at the classification which came from linnaeus he probably was influenced by him as well now there are quite a few other dermatologists who profess their love for botany and I've taken one dermatologist from one British dermatologist from each century Thomas Sydenham is one of the one of the most important physicians who encouraged medical professionals to go back to the bedside examine patients that's how we can look at uh, diagnose their condition properly now his contribution to dermatology is that he differentiated measles from scarlet fever completely different conditions but were thought to be similar at that time and he has always professed his love for botany and botanists uh, he is also called the english hippocrates the next century thomas bateman he is the one who popularized uh, the work of robert willen in fact he is probably one of the the person who wrote one of the first textbooks of dermatology he too was incredibly keen on botany. Going to the next century where we look at an Irish dermatologist, John Nelligan. He published two textbooks on dermatology and he also wrote an atlas before he died quite young at the age of 48. He was part of the Dublin Horticultural Society and he gave very, very rare seeds to that society. And finally, the 20th century, Peter Saman, I think he actually trained with Professor AST. Now he's the one who described the association between yellow nails 
and lymphedema, what we now call the yellow nail syndrome. He was an incredibly keen gardener. Both he and his wife were keen gardeners. They had a huge garden. Uh, they also had um, multiple greenhouses and they won numerous horticultural awards. And uh, his specialty, I believe, was chrysanthemums. So you can see how dermatologists in so many centuries have been able to contribute uh, to their science because of their knowledge of botany. Next, let's go on to the benefits of how plants can affect the integument. I have two examples. One of them is a topical agent, which I've called how the rainforest saved our skin. And the second is a systemic agent, which is the story of Sincona. It's just a, a series of stories about how plants have been used for various skin conditions. The first one, how the rainforest saved our skin, we actually presented it as a, a poster in the BAD, the British Association of Dermatologists meeting a few years ago, along with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Bala and Dr. Lister. Now, for this, we need to travel to South America. We need to go to the Amazon, Amazonian rainforest where there is this tree called Veteropsis eraroba. Now, it grows in a very small area of land in the eastern coast of Brazil, in the Amazonian rainforest. It's a tall tree, more than 25 meters, and it flowers in the dry season, which is between May and June. But what's noteworthy is that it produces incredibly high quality wood, and that's used for carpentry and for construction. And because of that, it's been completely deforested, that whole area. And it's come to a stage when we now have to conserve this tree because it's nearly extinct. Now, it's been noticed that for many centuries, natives from South America used an extract from the stem of this tree, and they used it on what they called ringworm. Uh, the Portuguese conquered large amounts of land in South America uh, and what they did was they realized its medicinal value and they started exporting it to all their colonies. One of their colonies was Goa. Uh, they also exported it to their African colonies like Mozambique. But Goa was the only colony which re-exported it again. And that's the reason why it's called Goa powder. Now, the way they used uh, this in the East was they used to mix it with lime and vinegar and then they used to put it as a paste on the affected skin. Now nobody knew about this till 1874 when Farah, who was a, a medical doctor in Calcutta, or a British doctor posted in Calcutta, he reported its efficacy and he, he named his article Indian Ringworm and its treatment by Goa powder. The way it came into um, a wider renown in the dermatological circles, in particularly in the West, is by Balamno Squire. Now he serendipitously noticed that one of his patients who had psoriasis had wrongly applied it because he thought it was ringworm. It was actually annular psoriasis, but the patient put it on that area. And when Balamno Squire saw him in clinic, this was in 1878, he noted that the psoriasis had completely disappeared. And he also noted that it caused a bit of irritation of skin and it caused some pigmentation of the skin as well. Now, the active ingredient in goa powder was chrysorobin. Now, in World War I, there was problems with trade between Brazil and Germany. So the German scientists, uh, the company called Bayer, made a synthetic analog and that was called anthridin or dithrinol. And for many decades, for the whole of the 20th century, it was the main drug for psoriasis. I remember when I started training um, in dermatology in the UK, we used to have wards full of patients who just had dithrinol. And it was made popular by various dermatologists like John Ingram, which is where, how we get the Ingram regime. And to date, it probably is one of the best topical treatments for psoriasis. Even though there are biologics now, the remission rate which we got from Dithinol treatment was far superior. Once you had a course of treatment, it kept the psoriasis away for many, many months. So really, should we actually say that the rainforest just saved our skin? Could it save us as well? Certainly, that's probably the hope because new plant species are being discovered every year. Now, knowing what we know about how it affected the skin and how useful it has been, 
we have to be evangelical in supporting and conserving the flora. For all you know, we may well find some plant with a cure for all emerging diseases, perhaps even COVID. The next is a systemic agent which has probably saved innumerable lives. All of them. This is called the Hilkona story. This is the, tree, the bark of the tree, which has been a boon to mankind. So for this, again, we'll have to go to South America. This was a legend. The Countess of Chincon, who's from Spain, became ill with very, very high fever, and she was on, uh, on her deathbed. When the governor of Loya, he, this is now in southern Ecuador, heard about it, he sent her a pack of a dried bark, and this was called Quina Quina. She took the bark and she miraculously survived. And then she was so enamored by it, she brought it back to Spain and she gave it to all her estate workers and they were all healed of their fevers as well. Now, this is a legend and on closer scrutiny, it doesn't actually stand good. What could, what actually happened was the Jesuit missionaries, when they went to South America, they noticed that many of the Native Americans who were forced to work in silver mines and became ill with fevers, when they took these powdered barks, they were actually cleared of these fevers. Now, the Jesuits knew there was something in this, so they brought it back to Europe uh, in the 1650s. Now, remember, in the 1650s, malaria was endemic in Europe. In fact, the current treatment in Europe at that time was bloodletting. So when the Jesuit missionaries brought this, it was, it was an amazing amount, uh, amazing discovery for them. However, there was a lot of anti-Catholic feeling in Europe. Protestants were extremely suspicious and they called it a popish plot and they never took it. In fact, Oliver Cromwell, who was the ruler of England, he died of malaria because he refused to take it and he called it the devil's powder. The active ingredient of in Jesuits powder is quinine. And the way it became popular is when King Charles II was cured of malaria. This is really ironic because King Charles II was actually exiled by Oliver Cromwell and came back to England only because of the death of Oliver Cromwell. One of the pharmacists living then, Robert Talbot, he very craftily mixed quinine or Jesuit's powder with wine and gave it to King Charles II and he was cured. And nobody knew what this contained at all and Robert Talbot made a lot of money by using this formula. Only after his death was it known that the ingredient in it was quinine and then it became famous all over the world. Everybody started using it. So Sincona bark was then used to treat fevers all over the world. The way it's benefited dermatologists is that the synthetic analogues and quinine itself, for example, uh, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine and quinine have been used to treat a variety of inflammatory conditions and we still use it all over uh, for quite a few skin problems now. Considering that malaria affects 500 million people a year, of which 2 million people die, if you look at quinine and its derivatives, it's probably saved more lives than any other drug in mankind. And that's the reason why it's commemorated in so many stamps uh, all over the world. So remember, all of this is from a humble origin from a tree. Next, let's look on how there can be detrimental effects of plants on the skin. I have three examples. Two of them are topical. I've named them the Scourge of India. And then we have Dobi H and a trail to Washington, which is one particular chemical. And then finally, a systemic agent, Beware of Celery. So let's start off with the Scourge of India. We presented this uh, in the British Association of Dermatologists annual meet a few years ago. The backdrop is, is India in 1950s. At that point, there was a famine in the Indian subcontinent. There was not enough food uh, to feed its population. So India had to depend on foreign aid. So they passed an act called the Food for Peace Program. This was in 1954. And from 1955 to 1964, for 10 years, wheat was exported from the United States to India. And it all came via Pune. So Pune is where all the shipments of wheat was held. But hiding in this consignment was a medical catastrophe. And that was this. This is the Parthenium weed. And unfortunately, it has really resulted in a scourge for most Indians. 
Now, this is Parthenium hysterophorus. It, it is found in the tropical areas of America and it has the largest quantities of sesquiterpin lactone, which is an incredible sensitizer. Within a few years, all around Pune is affected. It's, uh, it had no natural enemies at all, this particular weed in India. And then it started traveling along the length and breadth of the country. It, it went always along the ways by which grain was transported. So it went along the roads, the railway lines, the canals, all around it was where we found uh, uh, Parthenium. It was also a very rapid germinator. Every four weeks it would set seed. It would, it would get nearly 15,000 seeds. And each one of these seeds can remain dormant for many years before it started coming up again. Unfortunately, it had a devastating effect on the ecosystem. It completely destroyed all the ag agricultural productivity. So the amount of crops that were being cultivated decreased. And again, it affected the animals feeding on it as well. It pro produced a lot of cutaneous changes. And not only that, it produced systemic effects on sheep and buffalo. So it causes degenerative kidney disease and liver changes. So it affect not only the crops, but it also affected the cattle. More importantly, it affected humans. It affected, uh, it produced a severe airborne contact dermatitis and it was always middle-aged men who had jobs outdoors, usually very poor people. For example, farmers, outdoor workers, day laborers, and they had an incredibly chronic course. It's almost impossible to treat it once you've got it. And there used to be fluctuations, exacerbations during summer when it would set seed even more. And it was a progressive worsening of the skin condition with incredible symptoms. Now, this is um, classical airborne contact photodermatitis with Parthenium. You can see that it affects not only the exposed areas, the face and the neck. I'm sure some of you may actually remember this patient from when I was working in MMC. But it also starts affecting the non-involved areas after some time. And it's a miserable condition because it's incredibly itchy. The patients can't go out. So they went, kept going down the prop, uh, poverty spiral. And unfortunately, it's a very, very devastating infection. So it shows how an act of benevolence can cause untold misery in those who get this condition. Next is... Uh, Two, two different stories on the same condition, the same chemical. One, one is Dobie H and the second is a trail to Washington. The first one, Dobie H, I've, uh, it's based on a case report which was written by Asha Kuba from Delhi. It was a 31-year-old gentleman who developed a sudden onset of a rash on his face and on his trunk. Um, he had erythematous patches with vesicles and the relevant history here was a couple of days earlier he had burnt branches of a tree um, and this was the appearance. You can see a lot of hemorrhagic crusting on the face and then within a few days of treatment with topical steroids the condition improved to a great extent. He wasn't wearing a shirt so you can see that it affected his trunk as well and the histology showed spongiotic changes which is consistent with an examitous process. And this was the culprit. It's called the semicarpus. It's a semi-deciduous tree. It's medium in height and it's one of the plants which produces an incredibly common allergic and irritant contact dermatitis. And it's called, it's called a marking duct dermatitis because it's otherwise called marking duct or dobie nut. Uh, and it's caused by an oleoresin. And the thing is, it's persistent clothes and other objects for many, many weeks, even after you've tried to rub it off. Now, marking nut is also called doby nut because dobies in India used to take that and mark the clothes. Now, when British soldiers were stationed in India, many of their clothes used to be washed by dobies. And when they got the clothes back, many of these soldiers used to get itching, particularly around the neck and in the waistline. So the Brit British people, the British uh, army generals felt that it was because of the poor hygienic purposes, uh, practices by the dobies. They were not washing their clothes properly and they said it's a fungal infection. In fact, even today, Tinea cruris is called dobie itch. Actually, it's not a fungal infection at all. This was an, uh, an article which I came across just a few days ago, which was published in 1943. This was an American uh, major, Major Livingwood, 
and he clearly showed in a big series of patients that this was an irritant an allergic contact sensitivity and he could find no evidence of fungal infection at all in many in almost all the patients 344 patients who had dobe itch in fact he had used really really strong words he said that dobe is used to boil the clothes use a high alkaline native soap and then they used to expose it to the sun now none of these are practices which can possibly increase the amount of fungal uh, infection in the skin and he actually finishes by saying please do not use the words dobe itch for as a synonym for tinea cruris he actually said we should call it a dobe mark dermatitis so unfortunately it has fallen on deaf ears because even till two weeks ago i thought dobe itch means it's a fungal infection so it looks like we've stigmatized a profession for merely 100 years and i think it's high time we exonerated the name uh, for the, the the work that dobies have done uh, over the years over the centuries there is a connection to washington with this and that was in the very next article in the jama in 1943 where a rash was noticed amongst a cluster of government workers um, who were based in washington 16 of them were affected and even in those days, there used to be something called a dermatosis investigation section, which is amazing. This is in 1943. Now, when they looked into the story, they found that in the post, there was actually a half open bottle. And that was a bottle which had something called Bilawal oil. And that was shipped from India. Now, three of the workers tried to, it was a black thick oil, and they tried to remove it from the surface of the post and they wiped it as best as they could and then they gave the post for it to be distributed. Nearly 50 other workers in that depot then spread the post to other, pay, uh, other people. Now, within a few hours, they developed itching and this was all in the exposed areas, in the hands and the forearms and the face. And then within 24 hours, they got a, a rash a vesicular eruption on the exposed areas. Some of these people actually touched the mail only five days later and even they got the itching at that point. And this was the article from 1943. And again, you can see that it was the marking nut and it was a marking nut dermatitis which caused it. It's amazing that the world was a global village even in the 1940s. And finally, uh, a word on on a systemic agent which can cause problems to the skin. So this was a 65 year old lady. She was a vegetarian. So she cooked a large celery in boiling water and then she used it as a soup and she drank all the juice in which it was cooked. This was on a Sunday and her usual custom on a Sunday morning was to visit a suntan parlor an hour later. Given what was to happen a few hours later, I think she would have been better off going to church. Um, but the following morning, she developed skin, she was erythrodermic basically. She had skin which was red everywhere and within 48 hours, she developed quite a lot of blisters as well. And this is the patient, she required two weeks in hospital because it was so inflamed. She needed topical steroids and systemic steroids. And when it was recovering, she developed an intense pain, what they call poover pain, almost similar to poover pain. And what she had was a phototoxic reaction to celery. Now we know that a variety of plants, celery, parslip and parsley contain sodalins. Now usually it's transmitted by topical agents. For example, if you touch it, all the harvesters of these plants can get a phytophotodermatologist, uh, phytophotodermatitis. But sometimes what not many people are aware of is that these are not destroyed by cooking. So even if you cook these plants and the juices, and then if you consume excessive quantities of them, you can have a photosensitivity. So it is a learning point for a dermatologist. So if we are giving any patient phototherapy, we should probably warn them that it can cause photosensitivity if you have large amounts of these uh, particular plant products. In fact, the archives article in which it came gives a specific warning. It says, warning to vegetarians, avoid excessive sun exposure or tanning boots after large intake of celery. So we've covered a lot of topics here. So let's just some reflect and summarize on what we can learn. 
So just like when we read the Bible and we try to put it into action on a day-to-day -day basis, we too should reflect on all this history and see how we can change our practice here uh, in current day modern medicine. So what we could probably learn is to follow Willen's scientific curiosity. So he was actually inspired more by botanists than by any medical doctors and perhaps we too should look at other specialties and see if they can offer something for us. Next, let's look at the awareness and be open-minded. Let's not just be uh, confined to medicine. Let's look at other subjects, maybe economics or psychology. They could offer so much, again, to uh, further development as good doctors. Let's not fence dermatology to the confines of a small greenhouse because there is a garden out there. In fact, there's a forest or even the entire world out there. So let me end with words of wisdom from a current Italian dermatologist. He said in the millennial ed edition of the archives, it is likely that the roots of dermatology of the future are already growing in someone else's garden. Given the incredible evidence that we have from the past, I suspect he's absolutely right. Thank you.